Well, good afternoon and welcome everybody to week five of Bluegrass. Uh, thank you again for coming. Um, before I start with uh, the program, I'd just like to mention that today we're doing two instruments after my little introductory section. Uh, we have David Gandon, who's going to be doing a presentation on the bass fiddle, and then I will do a presentation on the dobro. So those will be roughly a half an hour piece. So I'll have a, a little bit of an introduction. Um, continuing my tale of the history of bluegrass and its evolution over, over the years. Um, but before I start with that, I wanted to mention that uh, last, uh, next week's class is the last one. Um, and we're going to do vocal harmony and then uh, a concert in which we uh, kind of put all the pieces together and give you a, um, a, a sense of how it all sounds together. It's a concert, maybe a, a highfalutin way of saying uh, kind of a, 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 a rehearsed jam session. Um, but it'll be a lot of fun and we're all looking forward to that. Um, also, I wanted to mention that that same evening, Friday, May 17th, um, the Hudson Valley Bluegrass Association is presenting Mando Madness, four virtuoso <coughs> mandolin players and a bass fiddle. So as much mandolin as you can handle uh, with uh, just some terrific people and, and uh, that's gonna be at uh, 67 South Randolph Avenue mm -hmm. in Poughkeepsie at the Unitarian Fellowship. Uh, starting around, I think, 7.30, right? 7.30, but there's going to be an open jam at 6.30. Okay, Anyone so. Anyone wants to come early, an extra concert. Some wonderful musicians there. Uh, and uh, so a good time will be had by all. And on a personal note, I'd like to take a minute to thank two people who have really helped make this class possible and, 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 and uh, allowed us to, to do our work so well. Um, Lynn Lifton. Thank you. Um, who is seated here and she's kind of our, our all-purpose guru. She's the one who kind of organized it. It was the contact with the LLI and with Vassar and has been um, my computer maven and probably everybody else's and presenting, putting together these beautiful slideshows and, and clips that you've seen um, and just organizing it and helping us do what, what we do here. Uh, I'd like to, to thank Lynn and acknowledge her work. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge person at the very back of the classroom every week behind all the cameras, uh, Fred Robbins, uh, our videographer and sound recorder, audio and video engineer. Um, Fred is uh, somebody who has been taking recording on still cameras and audio and video bluegrass music since the 1960s. Uh, he was present at the second of the multi-day bluegrass festivals that I mentioned that happened, the second, uh, 1966. Carlton Haney Bluegrass Festival of Fincastle, Virginia. Um, uh, back in those days, it was the, the devotees, I think, the people who were the cognoscenti of bluegrass, the fans out there, the really dedicated ones who were familiar with these things. And, and Fred was there when it started and got the ball rolling. Um, Fred is nationally known for, his, uh, probably internationally known for his work as a photographer. Um, bluegrass, uh, excuse me, Banjo Newsletter, which is the uh, national or international banjo publication has featured Fred's work on its cover uh, three times at least. Um, Earl Scruggs, Ralph Stanley, and Bill Keith. Uh, these were pictures that were all taken by Fred. I believe the, the Earl Scruggs picture was taken in 1968. It shows you how long Fred has been doing this um, and also how highly regarded Fred is by people who are really in the know in this business. I want to thank Fred for his work with the video. These will all be on the Hudson Valley Bluegrass Association website in case you missed anything and want to go back and see what happened. Uh, Fred's website is frobbi, that's F-R-O-B-B-I dot O-R-G. And on that you will find a treasure trove of his work over many years and the work of other people who have, uh, is that right Fred, other, other people who have also uh, uh, sent you material to be posted there. It's a, an archive of sound and video recordings and still photographs again, uh, going back to the 60s. Um, and uh, so again, thank you, Fred, for all you've done for us here. Um, so I'd like to spend a few minutes with the, the next chapter in, in Bluegrass, which is, you know, I was talking about the 1960s last time, and we've been following sort of bluegrass music as it evolved and spread. Um, I haven't talked about Monroe much since the second class, but I don't want to give the impression that Monroe's music was stagnant either. He was constantly um, evolving his music in ways 
uh, that were, I think, helped along by the musicians that he recruited over the years. The Bluegrass Boys became kind of a laboratory for, for uh, top bluegrass talent. Um, but Bill went out of his way to recruit young, really talented musicians who would push him, and he pushed back. And the music uh, changed, Bill's music changed, because of what those people brought to him. And especially in the 1950s and 60s, he had Kenny Baker on the fiddle. Ambrose mentioned Kenny a lot. Um, he also had Bill Keith on the five-string banjo. Bill is uh, on one of the covers there, one of Fred's pictures of Bill Keith. Um, Bill was, as Dick Bowden mentioned last week, one of the, probably next to Earl Scruggs, maybe at the same level as Earl Scruggs in terms of importance. People who um, really codified bluegrass banjo, developed it into what it is today. Um, and Monroe was thrilled to have the, the new technique that Bill brought to the five-string banjo in his band. Um, so Monroe's music, although it was still recognizable, Bill was always going to be Bill, um, but it changed in, in sound and evolved over the years. Um, and Bill was an inspiration to a lot of younger musicians. And in the 60s and 70s, younger musicians took the music up, bringing with them their own musical influences. A lot of them had come out of a pop or rock background. And so we ended up with uh, something that came to be called Newgrass after the name of this band right here, the Newgrass Revival. And here's a, an example, a, a clip of, of one of their recordings. <laughs> The song was written by a Texas songwriter named Tom Van Zandt and shows you again the fact that the, the, these musicians were willing to reach beyond what you might think of the traditional bluegrass repertoire for material. The original uh, newgrass band, if you like, was probably the Country Gentleman, which formed in the Washington, D.C. area in the late 1950s and uh, were kind of like the, the bluegrass boys in the sense that over the years many great bluegrass musicians passed through that band, but the one constant was always Charlie Waller, who was the guitar player and lead singer. This is uh, a recording, uh, I believe, from a, featuring an early 1970s version of the band uh, doing a cover of a rock and roll song that was popular in the late 60s. Uh, seldom Seen were uh, uh, featured a couple of country gentlemen alumni, uh, John Duffy and Tom Gray uh, on mandolin and bass, respectively. Um, the band was uh, initially formed with the idea that because they were all working full time in other occupations, uh, that they would be just a weekenders, so they came up with the name Seldom Seen. Um, that lasted for a while, but they became so popular and so influential that eventually they became pretty much a full-time touring outfit. The Dobro player in that band is somebody I'm going to talk about a little bit when I do my Dobro presentation, Mike Aldridge. He was one of the Dobro innovators and, and also my teacher when I lived in Washington, so let it rip. <laughs> That's a, an Eric Clapton rock and roll number that was popular in the 70s, and the scene covered that in, in the early 80s, which I think is about when that video comes from, because that was the addition of the band that I first saw when I was in Washington. Um, finally, I thought I'd give you a clip of the New South. This is, uh, again, cover of a rock song by uh, Fats Domino, I believe, called I'm Walking. <laughs> J.D. Crow, who is the, the leader of that group, is a banjo player. He's the, the, the person in the far left of that uh, album cover. That album was one of the most influential records of the 1970s in the bluegrass realm. J.D. Crow had started out 
uh, as, uh, as a banjo player with Jimmy Martin, who was one of the Bill Monroe protégés, um, and uh, in the 1950s had recorded on a bunch of iconic Jimmy Martin uh, recordings. Uh, and then in the late 60s started his own group, the Kentucky Mountain Boys, and it mutated into the New South. And he became one of the most influential bluegrass band leaders of that time. And again, somebody who was willing to reach out beyond the confines of traditional bluegrass repertoire. Uh, he played electric guitar also and, and was interested in country music and, and rock music. So uh, he recorded a lot of, of tunes like that that we just heard, an old rock and roll number. So uh, again, that, that's, that's that chapter in bluegrass in, in, in brief. Um, and with that, I'd like to uh, introduce our bass presenter, who's going to uh, discuss the uh, and demonstrate the, the bass fiddle um, and uh, tell us a little bit about the rhythm section in the bluegrass band. This is David Gandon. How y'all doing? Good. Right, can we move this back a little bit or I was going to stand here if that's okay so I don't want to mess up the program. Is that good? Well, I'd like to thank Andy and Lennon for having me up to do my bass thing. This is the bass. Y'all probably seen them before. Definitely the coolest looking instrument in the bluegrass <laughs> band, yes. right? You got these nice yeah. hips, curves. So, I don't know, they said we, I should tell you about the history of the bass and um, full disclosure, I'm no scholar of music or the history of the bass, but I did a little research, so. The first bass came on the scene, they think, said late 1500s. They, they, some pictures, medieval paintings, guys playing what sort of looked like a bass. Uh, they weren't sure whether it comes from, I don't know how much you know, but you have violins, uh, violas, cellos, and basses make the four stringed instruments. I know that I have young kids who are starting to play, so I'm, I'm being educated right now. But And the bass pretty much looks like a giant violin. Um, and a lot of the construction is the same. So some people, because if you're a scholar of music instrument history, say it came from the violin family, but apparently there was this other instrument line they called viols, or, and they had a flat back. So And they're a little different. So there's a debate out there among some scholars as to the true history, but it is a lot like a violin, and it has the, or, or the cello, what have you. You have the F holes, you have this bridge comes off. If I lowered the tension on the strings, this bass, this thing would just fall off. You don't want that to happen. And, and even worse, there's a bar in there from the back, a little post, they call it the bass bar, that pushes the front out. So if you, lessen, if you loosen up the tension, not only your bridge fall down, which isn't so bad because I mark it with a pencil, I know where to put it, but if that bass bar falls down, then you have a problem because my arms don't fit in here. So then you got to go to the bass guy, the luthier, and he has, looks like dental tools. They go in there with a uh, light and mirrors and they can do their thing. But it's a headache you don't want. Um, the early basses, you see pictures, apparently there were a lot of three string basses and uh, different sizes. It, it never really became standardized. I guess violins or, or cellos and violas, from what I read, are more standard in how they're sizing. Basses are not. There, there's different size basses to this day. Some of the, the hips are wider on some. They come in different sizes. This is a three-quarter size bass. So there's a, I guess there'd be a seven-eighths, even bigger, and a full size, which I, you know, I don't know that I've ever held one three quarters pretty standard for I think uh, most types of music you hear nowadays most people are playing although uh, I'm sure people do play full-size basses what else can I tell you about it this top is made of plywood uh, a really fine base this would be carved out of a solid piece of wood um, back I think is uh, I don't even know the fingerboard is rosewood you can see with some guy was refinishing mine and he didn't quite paint it. I think it's supposed to be ebony on a really good one, black wood like the piano keys. So, But this is rosewood which is a nice hard wood and um, four strings 
tone E, A, D, G. That would be fourths. E, F, G, A, four, A, B, C, D, and keep going. Opposed to violins or fifths and cellos, what have you. Um, any questions about that so far? Comments? Okay, so as far as the history of the bass musically, it was a classical type instrument for centuries. And I'm sure people here know far more than I do about classical music and different composers and scores and they wrote pieces for the bass. I know the, and it's played with a bow. I didn't bring a bow, I mess around with it sometimes. You get a nice deep sound, especially in these low. It's pretty low and uh, that's a low E, you bow that, it sounds like it's a nice big powerful rich sound. And my understanding is in, in classical music, I mean, the bass parts are simpler than violin or viola parts. You're not playing, you know, fast passages because it's it's a bigger instrument. Not to say that bass players don't have the technique to do that. Many certainly do now. And uh, but historically, it was longer tones, quarter notes, um, and I think that's where the bass really had its home up until the early 1900s. And at that time different types of music started evolving in this country. And again, I'm no music historian, but you had ragtime, and then with the birth of uh, jazz and, and horns, you had a bunch of early jazz bands where they had a tuba, which is sort of the same register as the bass. And they would do the same, you know, they would play the low end of the, of the sound. But I think you know, that tradition was marching bands, Spanish American War and around New Orleans and you know you had a tuba marching with the band but at some point my understanding is it moved off the streets and into the bars and brothels so then somebody said well I can play one of these things it's the same range maybe it's a little more you know I can do a little bit fancier things on this so I think that was the beginning of the upright bass sort of coming into popular American music around turn of the century, maybe 10, 20s, sometime around that. So you had uh, early jazz bands with an upright bass. I don't think, if you, you know, if you get the before bluegrass, I'm sure Andy told you all about the history, you had old time string bands, there wasn't a lot of bass. If you listen to those recordings, you don't hear a lot of bass. And, and my thought is, I don't, you know, this was a rural type music, you're out in the hills. I don't think there were a lot of basses lying around. I don't think people could afford basses. So they just didn't have them. People played what they had. Every now and then you'll see cellos in those instruments because all kinds of music, you want the, the range of sound. So you want the high end, the treble sounds, and then the mid range, and you want the low sound. It's just it's more pleasing to the ear when you have the whole package. And I don't care what kind of music you're playing, that's what people go for is, is the big picture. You know, with many exceptions, but so they would play the cellos in some of these old time bands, but they didn't really have basses. And now we'll go back to, but the jazz world, this was coming on strong. And in the beginning, it was a very simple, uh, you know, very simple beat. The early jazz players, and I, I've read interviews, you know, we're fortunate enough, many of them are now past, but they were doing this in 1920, you know, they, they were around, you know, 10, 15 years ago, and they would say, we were just making it up. How are we going to do this? You know, play any old thing, it'll sound good. So they would play that behind these, these uh, jazz bands, and it was hard to hear them. You're in a bar, he's got a trumpet, trombone. You got some loud instruments, and uh, maybe a piano, maybe a guitar. So this guy starts saying, well, how can I get this thing louder? The lower registers don't really cut. And bass players to this day struggle with that. But now we have amplification. So they would pull the strings instead of going. Well, you can hear that. But then they said, well, man, nobody can hear me. I'll go like this. Well, that's 
good. People can hear me now. Maybe I'll juice it up a little bit. So then they'd be like, they'd start hitting it back. Slap that thing. some work you hear that rattle okay so then some jazz bass players in the uh, they, they really started figuring out musically they got far more proficient on the instrument and you, you start in the 20s and 30s you have uh, some of these people playing with Duke Ellington orchestra and they, they can really play the bass all of a sudden this is no background instrument the the uh, technique really they, they can play in tune I mean you know these these I don't know if you saw the mandolin or the guitar, do you have those instruments, right? They got frets. Right? They got these things that go across, so you want to play this note. You know, they tell you exactly where to put your finger, at least you have a range. You know, violin or fiddle and bass, you don't have that. So it takes a little more practice and a little more concentration to play in tune. And some of these early jazz bass players really got good. And they started, instead of just doing this two beat, you know, they would sort of walk. Uh, Double up the beat. Right, and that's pretty basic, but they would start doing all kinds of different moves. So that's about as much as I can tell you about jazz bass. It's not my forte, but uh, jazz bass players are, tend to be the most proficient in technique as compared to country and bluegrass. Not that guys can't do that, but the music is not as complicated, the bass part. So now we'll get into this is a bluegrass class. So what happened with the bass? So the early bluegrass bands had basses. They needed that low tone. And um, if you listen to the early recordings from the 40s, the bass playing was not that technically difficult. They weren't even, you know, they might have had good time. Right? The beat was very important, the power of the beat. But in terms of whether they were playing in tune, you really listen, some of it's a little out there. Um, and, and my understanding is uh, these are people trying to make a living. So maybe the bass player was driving the, I don't know, even have a bus back then, the car, or whatever, they with the instruments. Or um, I think there's a history in country music of the bass player being the comedian in the band. He had a whole hillbilly show. Even though some of these guys weren't hillbillies, they were putting on a show. It's entertainment. So they'd put on the overalls and play up the... Uh, you know, country boy act, and the bass player would be the goofball in the band. And you had that. Um, some of these guys had great time. So, I, you know, what makes a musician great, that's very subjective. But they, they really kept the beat in the band. Um, and so that's how the, the bass comes into bluegrass. A lot of the early bass players, you know, Nashville started becoming, Nashville, Tennessee, a recording center for country music. And there's a handful of early bass players who were playing with Bill Monroe and Hank Williams. They were the guy, or the guys in town who, so maybe these bands would go on the road, they'd find who they could, but when they got on record, they wanted someone in the studio who was gonna play just right on the beat and get the tune. And there's a handful of these bass players, and unless you're a bass player, or you're into this, or a you know, real music geek, nobody knows who these people are. But you know, it's, they were great players, you know, guys like uh, Cedric Rainwater, Lightning Chance, Ernie Newton. If you look at old recordings, you see the same guys on all these recordings because they were the guys who people wanted to play with them. Um, what else can we say about the bass? Am I doing okay so far? <laughs> you all with me? Yeah. All right. So, um, and so on records. Yeah. Are you saying that, that if they're not a part of the band, they actually get a credit? Like if I look at one of those old vinyls, it yeah. says who the players were. Well, on that's a whole other thing. So, no, a lot of these were session studio right. musicians who nowadays, or right now, I'm not, I don't know what happens nowadays. I could speak more what happened when I used to buy records. They would credit, but for many years, you buy old records, they would not give credit to the sidemen on the record. Some did, but rarely. These guys would get paid whatever union scale was or what have you. I, I don't know. But they wouldn't get credit. Uh, sometimes they did. Sometimes you could tell. I can tell with Bob Moore. This guy played on more country records than anybody from 
you know, Elvis to Patsy Cline. He had such a unique sound. He does these little triplet things. So I hear, I say, oh, that's Bob Moore. But that's because I'm a bass player and I you know, listen for that kind of thing. Um, but even to this day, I think, I don't know a lot about recording, but when you make an album, I think the producer picks a lot of the sidemen in Nashville. You might, you, I think you'd have to fight to get your working band on the record, depending on how big a star you are. Now, don't quote me on that, but that's my understanding of how recording goes. So they have studio musicians, and um, I'm getting a little off, but uh, I think a lot of re one of the reasons they made a lot of great records out of Nashville is they had these musicians who all could work. They had a couple A-lists, and they'd have a drummer, a bass player, a piano player, you know, fiddle. And these were great musicians, and they know how to play together so well, they'd bring someone in to record with a good song, whoever it may be, and the band just knocked it out of the park every time, and they could change the groove. And I, I think that's why you had a good 25 years of great recordings coming out of places like Nashville. I'm getting off, but I don't think that was unique to Nashville. Motown had the same thing. They had Stax Record in Memphis, L.A., the Wrecking Crew. They had these house studio bands that were just, they really laid it down. And I think there was a lot of good music made because of those bands, and they're sort of undersung uh, heroes of, of our musical tradition. Um, so, all right, we're back on bluegrass. So you had, um, yeah, Bill Monroe. Okay, so Bill Monroe had this idea about bluegrass and the role of the instruments, and it was sort of his vision that a lot of people amplified on. And I, I believe that he listened to early jazz, and he wanted everybody to solo. So on his early records, the bass takes a solo. That kind of got pulled back, you know, and even though they weren't, you know, great technical solos, it was just... All right, the mandolin did his thing, the banjo did, the fiddle, now the bass. And they would go. You know, different, they were, you know, some of them were good solos. And um, that kind of dropped back. And the bass sort of took a role to playing a two beat. Well, I, sh I should back up. So you have two, two kinds. When I say a two beat, you're going. All right, real simple. Maybe walk up. It's really a timekeeping function, not, not, not so often. Maybe some passing notes. Right, nothing fancy about it. It's just this big bottom sound that creates a big pad for all the other instruments, and it helps define the time of the band. Uh, but early on, the early bluegrass bands, you listen to early Bill Monroe and Flatten Scruggs, and, and particularly the Stanley Brothers, you know, they were contemporaries of the big band era where these jazz guys were doing all this crazy walking. So you hear a lot more bass where instead of just going, you yeah, have a guy who goes, oh no, you'd be, they'd walk it, which gives a real lift to the music, a real lift to the music. And a lot of the early bluegrass records have that. I really like that sound, maybe because I'm a bass player and it gives me something more to do. But, um, <laughs> It kind of went away, and I, I can't speak to why, but and the bass seemed to take a real background role with a couple exceptions. There were a few players, I think Andy just showed one, this guy Tom Gray who played with um, the Country Gentleman. He picked up, well, I'll, I'll give credit, so not that you know, maybe, I don't mean, maybe you know all this, but the guy who played with the Stanley Brothers named George Shuffler, he was walking all over this thing. I mean, a really accomplished musician. And if you listen to those records, it just pops out at you. It really makes the sound of the band in a lot of ways because it's such a different beat. And this guy, Tom Gray, I think, picked up, uh, took a page from him and did the same thing. But not too many bass players stayed on that uh, path. And they kind of took a background role. And then I would say, well, now that's not to say that a lot of bass players aren't great musicians. A lot of them who would just play the simple bass part, I mean, they could play either other instruments, banjo, and they were great, but that was just the role they wanted of, of the bass in the band. That was the sound they wanted. They just wanted to play your role, and it's important to play your part. You know, you're not always trying to be the star of the show, and the bass was a background part of the band, and I'm okay with that, and I think, you know, that, that was what the, the leader of the band wanted, so that, that was sort of the role. Um, all right, instead of rambling, I thought to show you the, just a simple background of what I kind of did, but I brought a CD player here. This is what I do in my basement at night. So you can get a little window into my world. And this is uh, 
just the CD here, and I'll just play along with just for a minute. You'll see what the bass does in a simple way. And this is going because this he, he opens the banjo with just the banjo, so be real dramatic when the bass comes in. Plus, you can't hear the bass that well on this little jam box here. Okay, so I'll providing that bottom end and it really makes a big difference when you, you have a, a guitar playing and a banjo and a, a fiddle it's great I mean you know they can do it all but when the bass steps into the mix even though it, it may not be uh, you know as technique based in bluegrass as some of these other instruments when that bottom end comes in it really makes the sound it gives the whole thing a lift everybody smiles like ah they, they can kind of relax a little bit it gives a, a big bottom end it helps to find the rhythm um, there are some, now that I've kind of dumbed it all down, there are some phenomenal bluegrass uh, bass players in terms of their musicianship, especially now. It seems like they're getting better and better. And of all the instruments, I think, you know, Bill Monroe is a, is a virtuoso on the mandolin. Earl Scruggs is a virtuoso on the uh, banjo. Josh Graves on the drum. From the beginning, you had guys on the, these instruments who are really, really good. The bass, I think, has come the furthest. Now you have bass players who, some of them, I mean, they can do everything on the bass. They may choose to play in a background role, but the, the level of bass player is, is very high. Um, anything else? Anybody questions? All right, yes, please. Um, so how did you get started on this instrument, and why did you choose this instrument? Right, OK. Well, I, I uh, like a lot of teenagers, I had a guitar, and I was trying to learn rock and roll, and then I got a little older and uh, I, I got into bluegrass music and I was just messing around on the guitar and it really was circ just by happenstance. I was, I had lived in Virginia for some time and a friend of mine, I mentioned, oh, I'm thinking about getting a bass because his wife was a bass player just to mess around with. And um, he said, oh, we, we know this woman who sells basses. She gets them from an old school. And I said, oh, okay, well, maybe if she has one, I'll check it out. And then I left there, and I went down to um, the Outer Banks of North Carolina. They lived in Disputana, Virginia, Jack and Anna Beal. You see this on the internet? Great folks, good guitar player. And uh, when I came back to their house on the way back to New York, they said, hey, we, we bought the bass. <laughs> and I said, oh, great. I thought Ann, they bought it for his wife Ann. I said, uh, oh, okay, a little disappointment because I was thinking maybe I would buy the bass. And I said, well, that's great. They're like, no, we bought it for you. <laughs> and I, you know, I said, not. So basically, I gave them the money and I put the car. I had a, a sedan type car. I had to put the front seat way back. <laughs> and I drove back to New York with this is the bass that I got. And it uh, turned out to be a good bass. For as, as far as a plywood bass, it's made by the King Bass Company. It's got a nice brass plate here. King Moritone in Ohio. I think I checked the serial number, about 1956. And uh, as far as a plywood bass, this is one of the, it was uh, one of the better made American plywood basses, which I didn't know for years. You see on the tailpiece, I think that's Army Airborne. If you look, can you all see that? The AA, so I think uh, this probably was a military base at some point in the army and you know got pawned off to the schools and now I'm lucky enough to own it. 
Yes. I, I noticed in the last few concerts that we had, um, typically once for one number, they'll give the bass player a solo. But it's always, it's one of the biggest responses from the crowd. I, maybe because it's so unusual for the bass player to step up and do a solo. But the, the crowd always goes, goes crazy. Well, I would have to agree with that. Um, I think part of it is it's different, right? Sonically, you get used to hearing a sound when you're at a concert. So then when you hear something different, it kind of lifts you up. You're like, hey, what's this all about? I haven't heard this before. I once played a gig, and I remember on the first tune, the guy said, you want to take a solo? And I, I really liked the solo on that number, but I said no, because it was too soon. <laughs> right? You want to save it. You don't want to give it all away. <laughs> sort of the idea. You know, um, that said... Look, I'm biased. I'm a bass player. I think there's room for more bass solos in bluegrass. I think because people like it. I don't know if the people in the band like it, but the audience always responds well to it, um, particularly when you slap, which has a pretty limited role. You wouldn't want to do that on every song or certain kinds of numbers, but when you do it, and if somebody knows how to do it well, I mean, people seem to like it. You know, give the people what they want is what I say. But it's true. <laughs> I think, you know, for the rest of the band, ah, the bass is sort of an afterthought. You're in the back there, uh, which is very different than jazz. I mean, now the, the bass is routinely solo, right? You, you go to a jazz show, the sax does its thing, you know, the trumpet does its thing, maybe the keyboards, the drummer, and the bass. Everybody gets a big solo. Now, that said, I, I'll tell you an old music joke. It's not a great one, but it, it makes a point. So this anthropologist is... Um, out in the South Pacific, and he, he meets these island folk, and uh, he's ingratiating himself to the island folk, and uh, he's there for two days, and for the first whole day, he hears this drumming, he hears this drumming, drumming, and finally, he, he learns to communicate, and someone says to him, drum solo, drum solo end, very bad. So, oh, what's going to happen? Then a couple hours later, somebody else repeats this, drum solo end, very bad. Finally, someone else says to him, very bad, drum solo end. He says, what's going to happen? He's getting nervous. They say, bass solo. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's tough. You know, to, for, for most people, if they're not musicians, to follow. It's such a low register, the notes. Melodically, it's hard to hear what's going on. The musicians tend to listen because they're, they're tuned in. But uh, if it gets too much on the bass, it kind of loses the groove of the song. Yes. Interestingly enough, the last Hudson Valley concert, we had one of the most award-winning bass players currently today, Mike Bubb. Yeah, that's great. And I waited the whole two sets. They never gave him a solo. That's the way it goes. Well, he was probably hired as a side man exactly. for the gig. He learned their tunes, and they have an established show. And, you know, you got to do that show all these nights. You don't mess with the program. I mean, people do, but, you know. Sure, you know, he, he can do it if anybody can do it. He's a great player. Yeah. So when a song starts, are the other musicians looking to you to set the beat, or do you keep up with them oh, okay. where they're going? Well, I think in a good band, everybody bears responsibility for that. Um, and, and no one person is setting the time. It's, really, it's, a, it's a conversation. And if I'm playing music with people and it's going well, I'm really listening to what they're doing, and so and they're listening to what I'm doing, and together we sort of establish that groove. And you know, if it's if everybody's doing it, it's pretty locked in. And um, if it's not as uh, high caliber a band, then sometimes somebody will step up to establish the beat. But sometimes people get excited and they have to pull back. But the bass is a big part of that. Um, the mandolin is too. There's a chop. So, so you have the, the boom chick, which is, is so important to any kind of music. Well, bluegrass and swing, too. So the, you know, if you have four beats, boom, 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 boom. So what, what happens is you want boom, boom. You hear that chick? The chick is what gives it the lift. And so I just go. But you get that. So another instrument is doing that chick in the mandolin. So I'm playing on the one, boom, bass, mandolin, on the two, three, 
mandolin on the four, the dobro does it, banjo can do it, anybody can do it, but you want to have both those beats. And it's the same as a swing drummer. Boom, chick, boom, chick. He does it with an extra beat in there, but uh, that chick is what gives the music a lift. So when you say who establishes the beat, it's really this dialogue. You know, I can do it with the slap, but I, generally I wouldn't do it unless, unless I'm in a playing and, and the beat's gone. Then I might do that just to sort of loud and it kind of forces people back into that beat. Does that answer that question? Yeah, so but the bass is a big part of setting the beat. You know, they always blame the bass player when it, when it rushes. Oh, the bass player is rushing. I think that's overblown. I think a lot of time it's the lead person who's maybe not as familiar with the melody as, and so they're moving ahead and then it's a question, well, what do you do? You have to hold it together. Either you can move forward to them or you know, try to pull it back, and depending if it's live or, or just for fun, you're gonna have a different response. All right, am I over my time? You're looking no, at your you're watch. Good. No, you're good. Okay. Well, Any other questions? Okay, so, so I have to mention one other thing. Yeah. The old days, mm -hmm. those yeah. recordings were the whole band playing, and the, the bass set the time. Today, they don't even play together. They're all with earphones, and there's a click track that establishes that. So that was so important in the early recordings. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not a recording musician, so but uh, I think there's different ways to do it. But I think now they'll start with a click track and a rhythm guitar. But uh, yeah, I think you always put that. I, I did work up a, a showpiece number. It's not really bluegrass and. Uh, just because it's an excuse to do that, to be here. And uh, I go down to my basement, and I haven't done as much of this as I like, but it's sort of a, it's a train medley. And I don't know if you're familiar with these numbers, but we'll see how this goes right here. Um, let's see if we can start. Yeah, so it's were a big part of life in the uh, in the days that bluegrass music was getting started. It's going to take me a minute to uh, see if you're a dobro player. It's like you have to lay out all your tools like a surgeon. It's, uh, it's the most. I think it has the most uh, gear required to play. So I'm just going to do that.
So the Dobro is the one instrument that Bill Monroe never included in his band. It's the one instrument that's generally considered part of a bluegrass band um, that came after Monroe sort of set the pattern. Monroe had the, the mandolin, which he played, the fiddle, the guitar, um, the banjo, and the bass fiddle. And that was Bill's lineup pretty much uh, throughout his entire career. Um, twice in his life that I know of on Bill Monroe recordings, uh, he played with a dobro player. Uh, the first one was Barbara Mandrell, who was a multi-instrumentalist and played on an album that Bill did in the 1980s with some of the Grand Ole Opry stars. And the second one was Mike Aldridge, who I'll talk about a little bit, um, who played with Seldom Seen in Washington and was my dobro teacher. Um, the dobro came into bluegrass in the mid-1950s when Flatt and Scruggs, perhaps to distinguish their sound a little more from Bill Monroe's sound, added, hired uh, the dobro player who, uh, whose name was Burkett Graves. He became known as Uncle Josh Graves because he played a, a comedian character in the Flatt and Scruggs band whose name was Uncle Josh. And he and the bass player, as David mentioned, who was the other comic in the band, Jake Tullock, uh, used to have routines where just the two of them would do songs, often of a comic variety, um, and sort of entertain the folks and give the rest of the band a break. So this is a dobro. It's probably the most unusual of the bluegrass instruments. I should say right off the bat that dobro is a trade name, trademark owned by Gibson. This is, uh, the generic term is resonator guitar. This is actually a resonator guitar made by a different maker, uh, Paul Beard. Uh, this is a, a copy of an old 1930s vintage dobro of the type that was played by Josh Graves and by Mike Aldridge. Um, Paul Beard actually has one of Mike's old dobros and he got his uh, pattern from, from that to make these. Um, the dobro was an attempt to make a mechanically amplified guitar and the first ones were mechanically amplified Hawaiian guitars. Uh, you may have heard the term Hawaiian guitar. Hawaiian guitar refers to uh, playing the guitar with uh, a slide of some kind. This is a, a nicely machined smooth metal bar with a round curved edge um, that is used to alter the pitch of the strings, to raise and lower the pitch, um, and gives the, the sound a, sort of a continuous feel like you might get on a violin or on a bass fiddle or on an instrument without frets. Um, this resonator guitar is made to be played only with a, with a bar. Uh, the frets are on it but they're just there to tell you where to place the bar on the strings. Uh, you don't actually push the strings down to the frets. I don't know if you can see this, but the, the uh, strings are about between a, maybe a half an inch above the neck of the guitar. Um, the style of playing a guitar like this was developed in Hawaii in the late 19th century. Uh, the person or people who get credit for it, or there's some, I guess, scholarly dispute about who first came up with it. Uh, what's not disputed is that in the late 19th and early 20th century, this style of playing the guitar came to the United States with Hawaiian music ensembles, which were very popular. So the early 20th century, uh, this kind of music was, was popular. Um, they played with, a, again, a steel a bar and a traditional regular guitar, perhaps with a raised nut. So this particular type of guitar came along in the 1920s. But the concept of playing that kind of sound was uh, Hawaiian in, in origin and uh, began to be heard in the United States in the early 20th century. Um, the guitar was uh, a quiet instrument, a softer instrument, and um, by the 1920s, uh, a group of immigrant brothers from Czechoslovakia, the Depera brothers, um, decided to try their hand at making it louder. And what they came up with was a guitar with a speaker cone shaped piece of aluminum inside it. What you're seeing on the top is a cover plate which covers a, a bridge which transmits the string vibrations to a, an aluminum thing that looks a little like a pie tin, but it actually shaped more like a speaker cone and it serves the same function. It, it amplifies the vibrations of the strings and gives them sort of a distinctive twang so that that's what it sounds like 
the, uh, the tuning is, is uh, an op to an open chord. So when you strum this thing like a five string banjo, you get a G major chord. And in fact, the four top strings of the dobro are tuned the same as the four long strings of the five string banjo. So that, um, as Uncle Josh Graves was to demonstrate, banjo music can translate pretty well to this, to this instrument. Um, the dopera's timing was terrible because by the mid-1920s, electronic amplification was coming into, into style. The microphone was invented in the mid-20s, um, and people were at work on electrically amplified guitars. Uh, and by the early 1930s, there were electric guitars of the steel guitar variety, this type of guitar, um, with a pickup on it that enabled uh, a player to play through an amplifier. So the uh, concept of making a louder, an acoustically, mechanically amplified guitar became almost technologi te technologically obsolete almost overnight. But in a short time period that it was out there before our electronic amplification became common, uh, it was taken up by country musicians and blues players. And even after electric guitars became available, some of those people liked the sound and they kept it. Um, the first of the country players to, to really popularize this thing was a fellow named uh, Pete Kirby. Um, whose real first name was Beecher, and who played for over 50 years in the Roy Acuff Band. He joined Acuff in 1938. <coughs> Acuff became a member of the Grand Ole Opry around that time. Acuff's band was the most popular Opry act in the late 1930s and, and 1940s. And bashful brother Oswald on the Dobro was a popular uh, addition and probably the most identifiable aspect of Acuff's sound apart from Roy's voice, Roy's singing. Um, you may remember that last week Dick Bowden mentioned Bashful Brother Oswald as an old time banjo player, but Oswald, or Oz as he's called, was better known as, as a dobro player. And uh, I'll give you a little bit of a, of a clip. Oh, I'm sorry. Here's a little Hawaiian sound first. This is what Oswald learned from. Bashful brother Oswald was heavily influenced by the Hawaiian sound, and, and this is a, a tune that he did with Acuff uh, called The Great Speckled Bird. The first recording was a, a, a dobro player, a steel player named Bob Kai, who was one of the early Hawaiian guitar virtuosos, and uh, demonstrating that that kind of music was used, in, uh, that kind of guitar playing was used not only in, in strictly Hawaiian music, but also in music that was sort of pop music. It was kind of a jazzy, swingy flavor to it. Whereas uh, Oswald, who, who learned, I think, and was inspired by the Hawaiian players of the 1930s, um, translated into that sort of sound into a country style. One of the things that uh, David played for you in his medley was uh, a tune that was probably Roy Acuff's most popular tune. Um, uh, pardon me while I just check to make sure I'm still in tune. It's called the Wabash Cannonball and Oswald played that in a kind of a Hawaiian style, sort of like. in the Hawaiian style, it was a lot different from what Uncle Josh had come up with. 
Josh joined Flatt and Scruggs in the mid 1950s, 1955 or thereabouts. But he uh, he had met up with Earl some years before that, and Earl had showed him a little bit of what uh, uh, is known as the three finger banjo roll, which Dick talked a little bit about. The Scruggs style of playing, which is uh, involves thumb pick and two finger picks, and involves uh, sort of the melody is embedded in a series of, of uh, chord notes that are played along with it. So you get sort of a, a kind of a driving sound, like which is, again, something that uh, is a, a different from the prevailing style that Oswald had set back in the 30s and 40s. So let's have a little bit of, of uh, Uncle Josh here. Actually, was Uncle Josh playing an old blues number from, I believe, from Mississippi, from Armour and Smith? Um, I'm going to do a couple Uncle Josh tunes that are, uh, one of which sort of demonstrates the banjo sound that, that he uh, was doing with uh, Flat and Scruggs. It was uh, a tune called Fireball Mail, which was a, uh, uh, a Roy Acuff, uh, at least a tune that Roy Acuff recorded as a vocal number, a song with words that Acuff sang. Earl Scruggs played it on the banjo as a, as a banjo instrumental, and Josh played the dobro on that recording. And the first break is, uh, the first time through, I'll play it a little bit like Josh did, and then the second time I'll throw in some Josh blues licks that, that he didn't record uh, on that particular song, but, but that were sort of originated with him and showed his interest in the blues. We just saw a blues number. Uh, Josh was very much a, a blues player, and, and he liked to incorporate that. So this is Fireball Mail with a couple extra Josh blues licks thrown in. Josh, I picked out two Josh tunes because another one that isn't really very bluegrassy, but it doesn't really incorporate a lot of the roll style that, uh, you know, the Earl Scruggs banjo style, but it's one that I've always liked. It's something that Josh recorded with Latin Scruggs and Doc Watson back in the 60s. It's a tune that Bob Wills, the Western swing fiddle player and band leader, uh, made famous in the 1930s called the Spanish Two Step. And Josh took that and adopted it to the dobro fairly faithfully. Um, so I just Thought I'd play that one for you too because again it's it's just a, a I think a neat tune and it turns out well on the dobro. <laughs> major advance in bluegrass dobro playing was a guy named Mike Aldridge. 
Um, Mike started out playing Dobro in the late 1960s with uh, the band of Bill Emerson and Cliff Waldron in the D.C. area. His uncle, uh, a man named Ellsworth Cousins, had actually played the Dobro on recordings by Jimmy Rogers, who was one of the pioneers of country music recording in the late 20s and early 30s. So Mike came by his Dobro talent, honestly. Um, but he really was one of the people who sort of brought the Dobro beyond where the Josh Graves-inspired bluegrass players had taken it. Mike's playing was really smooth. It was characterized by just this beautiful, beautiful mellow tone uh, and just an innate musicality. This is an example of something he did later on in his career. It's uh, definitely not a bluegrass tune. It's a Duke Ellington tune, but let's hear a little bit of that. Mike was playing an eight-string dobro on that tune, so that uh, I've got six on here. So he was able to get a, a slightly different chord voicing that uh, was uh, more swingy and lent itself to uh, to that kind of uh, that kind of playing. Um, the, two, the Mike Alders tune that I picked to demonstrate is one that Mike showed me in his basement. I was fortunate enough when I started playing this instrument to uh, to be living in Washington, and I started going to the Birchmere to see the seldom seen and. And at that time, I was interested more in the banjo, but uh, and the banjo and the dobro were at opposite ends of the stage. But I gradually was so captivated by Mike's playing that I ended up sort of camped out in front of him um, when I would go to the Birchmere, which I did a lot. And uh, I ended up, he, he turned out to be a very accessible, very friendly guy and, and who, who taught, gave lessons on nights when he wasn't performing at, at his home in Silver Springs. So I ended up uh, taking lessons with him. And it was good that I started off on the right foot with somebody who was a wonderful teacher as well as a wonderful player and just a, a sweetie, a really nice guy. Um, and, and his playing was, was what captivated me and still does. I mean, there have been players, I think, subsequently who they have just taken the technique of the instrument, as David mentioned with the bass fiddle, the same with all the instruments in bluegrass, that the technique has continued to evolve. Um, and uh, one of the, uh, we'll, we'll get to, uh, Actually, if you could skip back to Jerry, but uh, the two people who are, are preeminent in the Dobro world now, Jerry Douglas and, and Rob Ikes, we'll get to them in just a minute. Uh, I wanted to play uh, a slightly simpler Mike Aldridge uh, tune. This is for, uh, a tune that Mike didn't write, but he popularized a banjo number called Pickaway that's on his first solo album from 1972. <laughs> sort of banjo-y kind of moves in it. Again, the sort of the, you know. That sort of thing is, again, very much in the Josh Graves mold. Um, after, as I said, after Mike, uh, a guy, Jerry Douglas, came along. Jerry was uh, from Ohio. He was inspired by, by Uncle Josh and by Mike Aldridge. Um, this is Jerry Douglas playing an old swing number sort of country swing number called Cincinnati Rag, along with Bela Fleck, one of the banjo virtuosos that Dick mentioned last week. I'm guessing that that was uh, early 80s. Uh, again, it, it, that, that was 
I mean, that's, that, that was fine playing for the day or for any day. That, that, that's just incredibly fast and yet clear and beautiful. Um, and the next, the next one I want to mention is Rob Ikes, who was here a couple of weeks ago in, in Poughkeepsie playing for the HVBA. Um, he, he and Jerry Douglas, as I said, are kind of the two probably best known resonator guitar players, although there are a host of other younger players out there, one of whom I'll mention in a minute. This is Rob Ikes playing an old traditional fiddle tune. And what all these players have in common is, is just incredible technique wedded to this innate musicality, this, this, this ability to, to create beautiful sound uh, that people haven't heard before. Um, it, it's, I felt it very strongly when I was uh, Mike Aldridge's student that there was, when I'd be sitting opposite him in his basement with my dobro on my lap, you know, there was this, this, although he was very friendly and very low key, there was this palpable musical energy that he radiated. It was like electricity. It, it kind of was, it felt like he'd been a little bit jolted in a good way uh, at the end of a lesson. He, he really, uh, he had that and, and, and it came through in his music too, this incredible musicality. And, and it's the same of all the people we've been talking about, Bill Monroe, Bill Keith, Earl Scruggs. They just had so much music in them and they were so driven to create sounds that people hadn't heard before. I'd like to close with uh, a tune that's, uh, that I got from a, a young Dobro, younger Dobro player named Mike Witcher, who uh, is one of the, the, the current generation of Dobro virtuosos, uh, of whom there are many. Um, Mike took an old-time fiddle number called Red Prairie Dawn that was written by uh, an Illinois fiddle player named Gary Harrison. Um, it's a beautiful melody, and Gary Harrison had, had played it very fast on the fiddle in the key of A, and Mike had the creativity to realize that would sound really nice in the key of G, so I can play it on the dobro, which is tuned to a G chord. And if I slow it down, it's going to have a whole different vibe to it, a whole different feel. It's still going to be beautiful, but it's going to be different. And I, I, I love the, the melody. I like the Gary Harrison fiddle rendition. I like the, the Mike Witcher dobro rendition. Um, but the dobro rendition, I think, is something, as I said, pretty, and, and it captures some of the, the unique things you can do with the dobro. So here goes. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. played it in A, he could either tune the dobro up a whole step or he could have put a capo on. Yeah. But I think he just heard it as sounding nicer and different. Again, he was recreating a tune and arranging it, making it, doing what a good cover always does, which is 
make you hear the tune in a new way. I mean, you, you, people cover tunes all the time, songs that have been made popular by others. And as I said, a good cover is like a revelation. It's like a new way of hearing the tune. And that's what he did with this. He just made it sing in a different way. I mean, it's, the original is, is beautiful. And, and if you're interested, you go online, you Google Gary Harris, and you type in Red Prairie Dawn, you'll probably come up with a lot of covers. Um, but the original's out there. Uh, and it's just, it's just beautiful fiddle playing, and, and it's a beautiful melody by a wonderful fiddler and composer. Um, and Rob Ike's, in a sense, recomposed it. I mean, it's the same air, but he slowed it way down, and he dropped it down in tonality, a key, and he put it on a different instrument, and it just came out like that, only it was nicer when, when, uh, when Mike played it, but, uh, but you got the idea. Um, so, any questions? I mean, I know I've said a lot, kind of filled the room up. Uh, again, this is the most unusual bluegrass instrument, I think, at least familiar. So when you're moving the, the metal ball around, are you generally touching just one string at a time? Um, it, it depends. The answer is sometimes yes and sometimes no. You can play, you can play it like uh, one string at a time, like, like I did on that tune. But you can also do harmonies with, uh, you know, you can play multiple strings. So. strings sometimes uh, separated, uh, you might be playing strings two and four. That tends to be more of a traditional sound or, or even adjacent string. And you don't have to play the bar straight across the strings either, which gives you just major chords. You can, you can angle the bar and get different harmonies to... to Types of sounds that way. Any other questions? Yeah. Is there any crossover in terms of the type of music that would be played between dobro versus a pedal steel guitar? Actually, I'm glad you asked me that. Um, the pedal steel is kind of like the, the sophisticated urban cousin to this thing. Um, the pedal steel came later, but it was the same idea playing um, guitar with a bar. Um, pedal steels often have more than six strings. A typical configuration might be eight or ten strings. Um, and instead of angling the bar to get different harmonies, they put on pedals and levers that you work with your feet and your knees, which will change the tuning of the strings so that a straight bar, you, can, you don't have to do this kind of thing. Um, you can, with a straight bar, get all kinds of changing harmonies. And, and the pedal steel became a very important part of country music and other kinds of music as well close to being over time. But uh, yeah, I mean, pedal steel tends to be more in country music. That's probably where it's most prominently used, but there's uh, you know a whole realm of other kinds of music that use it, sacred steel, you know, in, in gospel music. Um, uh, and in terms of complexity, the, it's like, it, this is the Model T and the pedal steel is like the cockpit of a 747. Um, but it's the same basic idea. You're playing with a bar, and you're, you know, trying to alter the, you know, the harmonies a little bit by changing the, the pitch of the strings as you're moving the bar up and down. So thank you for asking. I meant to include the pedal steel, and, and I didn't think of it. So. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. Thank you.